Hey everybody, welcome back to the Down to the Wire podcast. We have a very special guest for you guys today. I'm Bryce. I'm Ross. And joining us today, um, we have a special guest. His name is Jonathan DeMarte. Uh, just a little background on him. He was a two-time Gatorade High School Player of the Year for baseball. Played baseball at Richmond University. Uh, spent some time playing baseball in Canada and Australia as well. Then he made his way to Team Israel. Uh, played over there for a little while, still does. And uh, this year, actually, the beginning of this year, he uh, signed to the Chicago Cubs and is currently uh, training with them. What's up, Jonathan? What's up, guys? Thanks for having me. No problem. Thanks for thanks for joining. So um, we got some questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, so I'll let you go first, Ross. All right. Um, so, Jonathan, what was the high school to college process like for you and was it hard and how many offers did you receive and why Richmond? Uh, so you're saying more so like my decision for Richmond, not exactly like the transition. Yeah, more. Yeah. Why, why did you end up picking Richmond and was this the only offer you had? Was this one of multiple? Um, I had a really unique, I guess, decision-making process. Um, kind of goes hand in hand with my roundabout way getting into affiliate ball with the Cubs, I guess. But um, I, I was throwing hard, having success at like a pretty young age. Like I remember hitting 90 for the first time or 91, whatever, like when I was 15. So at that point, like you're hearing from schools all over the country. So my sophomore into junior summer, I literally my mailbox was flooded with letters from schools every single day, um, especially in like the summertime and fall time. Um, so before that, it was like the college process was like, all right, I'm there with my parents, like trying to make a list of what's going to be the best fit for me and everything like academically, athletic wise, if something happened and you're not playing a sport. And honestly, like all that was kind of I'm glad we did it, but it didn't really need to because there was a lot of schools that ended up like having a lot of interest in me. And uh, that fall, I received a, a bunch of offers from other schools and it was still early. I was still, I just turned 16 and um, Richmond was one of the schools that I had an offer from and they were really the only mid-major that I was like really interested in or considering. Um, I was having a lot of success at the time. Um, throwing, like I said, throwing hard, having success also offensively as a hitter too. Um, so this was really the only like mid-major that I considered and um uh, what really helped was my parents and people around me really did a good job of like making it known that like you have to pick a school that you can see yourself at without baseball and you, financially you don't want to go somewhere where if things don't work out you're going to have student loans built up after so I had a great scholarship offer there um, where I was going to have virtually no loans um, had a pretty I mean it's just a verbal agreement but from the coach saying no matter what happens injury whatnot like your scholarship will be retained and he gave us some examples of like things happening in the past where people got hurt or whatever happened and they kept their scholarship and another thing for me was deciding an ac a school academically that might be a little bit more of a challenge since I kind of breezed through high school, always knowing you're going to have somewhere to go play ball. Um, not the right mindset to have by any means, but like fortunately it worked out for me in at that time. And um, yeah, so I mean, all those things considered and really trusting in the coaches that my scholarship wasn't going to change, plus a an unofficial visit weekend where I felt really comfortable and welcomed from the players, both seniors to guys that were there on their official visits. Um, it just felt like the right place to me. I felt really comfortable there. I knew someone there who had a great baseball experience and loved it. And it ended up being the best decision I ever could have made. I think with the way that my career went, if I went to one of the larger schools that I was looking at, I would have been kicked off the team or not kicked off, but like removed from the team from all my injuries and everything that I, that I dealt with rather than like where Richmond retained my scholarship and always was a spot for me there on the team and let me, gave me a chance to transition to a two way guy. So a little bit unique. And I ended up deciding that fall of my junior year. So really early. So it was a long period of time. I had to sit with that decision, but um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what went into my decision-making process. Awesome. So, um, when you played in Australia and Canada, what was the competition like there compared to, like, the competition of baseball that you faced before you went there? Like, was it harder than college or, like, um, like... Yeah, so I guess I'll fill in some gaps for you there, like, when you guys gave the intro. 
Um, so from college to Nat until I signed, I played independent ball. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with independent ball. Yeah. Um, like, you know, the Rockland boulders. Near yeah. Our house. yeah. So the Quebec team that I played for in Canada is in the same league as the Rockland boulders. Okay. So it's in, that's independent ball, although it's in Canada. Um, right. so, and then playing in Australia, that was, that's essentially like their major leagues. Um, so that's guys who played professionally in the u.s currently play professionally for affiliates like myself in the u.s but are australian plus you can bring imports over from affiliates not affiliates independent ball like myself so all that context being said um the level of play like i started in the frontier league for independent ball in normal illinois i that was much higher level than college going from there to the Atlantic league, I've heard from guys that the Atlantic league is basically like triple a level of play. You have a lot of former big leaguers, guys with long careers. Um, so that Atlantic league was the highest level of baseball I ever played. I mean, the game sped up so much. Um, there were numerous big leaguers on the field at all times going to the Can-Am and playing in Quebec. I would put that league somewhere in between the frontier and the Atlantic. So where the frontier league might be more like high a ball, a ball, high A ball. I put I put the Can Am somewhere between high A and double A. So right between it was you had a decent amount of for, a handful of former major leaguers um, and a lot of guys who had some pretty long professional minor league affiliate careers. And then going to Australia, I would put Australia in that double A, triple A region where it was probably a step down, a little step down from the Atlantic League from top to bottom. But like, I mean, for example, Melbourne had like Delman Young hit fourth. They had a big leaguer hitting second, I think, and maybe first. And then another guy who was mashing hitting three hole. So like uh, the ABL playing in Australia was very high level of play. I'd say that was next to the Atlantic League. That's probably up there with the Can-Am and playing in Quebec in terms of overall level of competition. So was it independent ball and then Australia? Or was were they, they went hand in hand at the same time? Or were you um, able to play both? Well, they're different seasons. So Australia. Oh, they, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. Like, were they different oh, seasons or was yeah. it like, did you go from one right to the other? Or did you have like an off season? Um, was it this? Do you want to hear about all 2019? I'll, I'll lay it out for you guys. Um, so I went, I was, I started the year in the Atlantic League with the York Revolution in 2019. Okay. Spring, spring training in about a month, I think. I got released and then I signed with Quebec like a few hours later. And went there the next day, like, I, and I got there, like, with two days before their season. So I played the whole season there. But while I was playing in Quebec, I had to leave. Um, I had to leave in July for Bulgaria for our first quali- Olympic qualifier for Israel. Wow. I, came, I came back to Canada, played, like, two weeks, went back to Lithuania for our next qualifier, which was only, like, a few games. And then I came back to Quebec, played up until a few day, days before the season ended in Quebec and we were eliminated from the playoffs. So I left the, the season a few days early to go play in Germany where we then qualified for the next round in Italy. So went straight from Germany to Italy in September, spent the whole month of September basically in Europe, qualified for the Olympics with Team Israel. I came back in the end of September uh, and I basically then started the off-season training and got ready for winter ball in Australia. So winter ball in Australia starts like end of November, and my contract was only for the second half. So I went there. I flew to Australia um, on New Year's Eve, and that's when I left for that. And I mean, all winter ball, like Dominican, Venezuela, Mexico, Puerto Rico, Australia, Colombia, Panama, all those, they all happen like in the winter season. They don't overlap with the minor league season. The only one that overlaps really is like the summer league and the summer pro league in Mexico, which is you see a lot of former big leaguers, former, former minor leaguers go there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a Canada. lot of traveling. I, yeah, that's uh, a lot. I've, uh, I left for, um, I spent those few weeks in the officer that month and a half or whatever, between Olympic qualifiers and Australia in Richmond, Virginia. And, um, came back around the holidays. I left New Year's Eve for Australia. I went from Australia to Israel. I had to go straight to Israel after the Australia season to get approved to play in the Olympics. And then from Israel, I went straight to Arizona. I had a few workouts with major league teams. I signed with the Cubs there and then all this stuff happened. So I never made it back to New York and I ended up going with my brother from Arizona to California to quarantine with him out here. So that's why I'm on, when you said West Coast time before. I'm out here with him, and he actually works in the front office for the Angels. So 
that's how this all kind of worked out. And I haven't been back in New York since. So, wow. You uh, you actually sparked my memory because I had a baseball coach a few years ago who worked for the Boulders, and I remember him saying they had they had a uh, Quebec on the schedule. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, so here's the next question for you. Um, how and why did you decide to try out for Team Israel? And like, like how did you just find out like that you'd be like that you had the opportunity to play for them? Um, so the story with that goes. Uh, I will start with this. This is how I kind of go. How I tell this story. I will never forget in 2017, uh, spring of 17, we were playing in Texas at University of Texas, and I remember like staying up late that night before the game to watch like team Israel play, uh, in the world baseball classic, um, at that time. Um, so I was following rooting for them in the 17 world baseball classic that came in fifth, got an automatic burst for 2021. And I always said to myself, like, if I play professional baseball, like this is something I want to be a part of. I was born and raised Jewish, grew up Jewish. I knew I would be able to represent the team. Didn't know anything about baseball coming back to the Olympics. And randomly in 2018, when I was playing in the Frontier League with the normal Corn Belters, uh, ironically, around that time, Nate Mulberg, who is an assistant coach at University of Richmond, he came on during my sixth and final year. We became really close, became good friends, is Jewish and very involved in like Maccabi or was involved when he was younger in the Maccabi games um, and Israel baseball and all that. So. He apparently said something in the summer of 2018 to the person who was appointed manager of Team Israel about me. Don't know what happened behind the scenes there, but like literally right around the same time, the manager that I had in normal in the Frontier League asked us if we if anybody was interested in playing winter ball, like any of those winter leagues that I just mentioned to you guys. And I said, like, oh, I'd love to play for Team Israel. There's no league in Israel. Well, there's youth. There's younger leagues. There's no professional league in Israel. I just simply said that saying, like, I'd love to play for them in the next World Baseball Classic. Legit, the next morning, I got a call from him saying, hey, uh, it's made a few phone calls yesterday. Um, made a few phone calls yesterday, and you're going to get a call from either the general manager or the manager of Team Israel. Like, it seems like they're interested in having you. Like, I don't know much else, but just expect a call. And either that day or the following day, I got a call from the manager who's actually based out of Elmsford and has a baseball facility just south of us in Elmsford. Had no idea it was there. I heard heard of it, but didn't know the connection. And he basically was like, Jonathan, like, well, he calls me Johnny. And he that's he and said that immediately on the phone. He's like, Johnny, like, if you're healthy um, and you're still playing, I had no idea you were an independent ball. I had no idea you were Jewish because of your last name. Like, I would love to have you. Yeah. So apparently his oldest son is my wow. age. His oldest son's my age. I don't forget what high school they went to down county. I think we played together in high or played against each other in high school, and then he played at Bucknell, and I pitched against Bucknell in college. So like, I didn't know the whole, the guys, the managers, Eric Holtz. I didn't know the Holtz family. I had heard of them, but I didn't know the connection. I didn't know who he knew who I was, and then he obviously didn't know I was Jewish. So I literally got the call from him after all that happened. He's like, "Look, like you're willing and you're healthy. Like we'd love to have you on the team." And then explain to me, like, the, how the citizenship process works and how I'll be hearing from people involved in that if this is something I want to do. And I was I was on board right away. Um, and I mean, being connected and being a part of of Israel and representing Jewish people all over the world, like has become a huge, huge part of my life and something that means a lot to me. So thanks for asking this question, because, I mean, yeah, it's opened up a million doors in into my life. Yeah, that's an awesome story. Um, you yeah. said Elmsford. For, so for a second, I thought you were going to say Donovan Mitchell's dad. <laughs> uh, so Eric, so Eric Holtz and Donovan, Eric Holtz, the owner of the facility and our manager and Donovan Mitchell are like, like they're really tight. Like they're really? Jewish. He's, like oh, he's really shit. good friends with uh, the Mitchell family. Like, he, I've, I've, I've actually met him at his facility before. That's like, awesome. His jersey's hanging up all over. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Wow. I, I know his, well, I don't know his dad. I met his dad uh, a few times because when I was like 12 playing for the Westchester Nationals, during the winter, he like coached us. He wasn't our coach, but he just coached us during the winter. Ah, so, yeah. Okay. He's not going to remember me, though. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. Just for every, just for all the listeners, too, um, we're talking, this is uh, West Northern Westchester, New York. That's where we are, where we do our, it's where Bryce and I are from. So Elmsford's a bit farther south in Westchester. But just so for everyone who knows where we're talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so, you know, it was probably pretty tough hearing that the Olympics were going to be postponed um, from this year to next year. Uh, where were you when that, when you heard about this and, like, what was your reaction to the Olympics being postponed? Because you were supposed to play, weren't you? Yeah, um, so I was, I had permission from the Cubs when I signed um, to play in the Olympics and that's a commitment they said they're still going to honor for 2021 unless I'm lucky enough and I'm pitching in the big leagues then, then I won't be able to. Um, so I, I was, that, that hurt. Um, I will say like being with my brother in spring training and even now is an amazing distraction to like not be alone or I don't know, situations could be way worse. Um, but I mean, it started with obviously spring training getting cut short, not at the time realizing that it was most likely going to take our full season away. Um, so that was hard enough to deal with. And then shortly after to have the Olympics move back, because I really was in denial about that. Um, while also understanding the reality of the situation, um, that, that hurt. I mean, that, that was like a few days, week long where it was like, everything you did that idea lingered every ounce of training you do like that idea is in the back of your mind and like not that it held me back but it like makes it a little bit harder on that given day to like do what you need to do so it's something that has really bothered me um and you guys are catching it on a tough day because i don't know if you heard the news today but it's looking like the world baseball classic is now being moved to 2023 and i was supposed to be with the Olympics being moved back and there potentially being no minor league season this year, my first baseball would most likely be since, since Australia, my first thing would be the WBC in 2021 with Israel. I'm supposed to be on that team. And now it's looking like that's getting moved to 2023 also. So honestly, all this stuff is it's, it hits hard. I mean, cause for me, it's like, I've, I thought I've, should have gotten the opportunity at other times in years past. And I'm so thankful to have the opportunity now to be with an organization, um, to be with the Cubs, but then to have like the C's, the affiliate ball, like your chance to work your way up Olympics and WC, like all canceled within like an eight week period. Like it's, it's not sitting well. I mean, it doesn't affect my day to day work, but it's, it's, it hits hard. It hits close to home. Yeah. And not that now will that, so moving it to 2023, will that hinder the people on the team and the players on the team, or is that going to um, everyone's going to stay? I mean, there's there's so much unknown. I don't know. I mean, moving the Olympics could potentially change things. Um, like we added last minute, we added Ian Kinsler for 2020. Oh wow! If that if it was happening in two months, he got his citizenship in time. But now that this is pushed back another year, this might open up the door for more guys. Um, so, but the team dynamic, the WBC team for 2021 was not like fully chosen. I was just like told that I'm going to be on it just as someone on the Olympic team who had success and through a lot of high leverage innings, like I earned myself a spot for the WBC. And I mean, for me, it's nice that I guess long-term I can hopefully see myself in baseball through 2024, 25, maybe more. I mean, I, I, very much plan on being a part of that WBC team. So I'm going to do everything I can in my power to participate in the Olympics next year and then WBC and whenever it happens. And not, uh, not I didn't that even this, know Ian Kins. Sorry, go right. Uh, not that this <laughs> no, is more, no. not that this is more important than actually playing in the Olympics, but just like the location, like Japan, that's like such an awesome place to play baseball. I know. Yeah. Japan seems the atmosphere is, yeah, I mean, a lot. I know a lot of guys that were on the WBC team in 17. So, like, they got to play in Korea where the whole stadium was packed for BP and, like, they're chanting for players during batting practice <laughs> to, like, to playing in the Tokyo Dome against Japan in the Tokyo Dome and in front of, I don't know how many thousands of people were there, 50, 60,000, whatever it is. Like, the experience was for the WBC in 17 was supposed to be incredible. We were supposed to play in Yokohama Stadium, which is like 20, 30 minutes outside of Tokyo. Yeah. They're using the dome for other sports. But like every game sold out. Like we only, we barely get any tickets. Like we were going to play in front of so many people like on the world's biggest stage. So it's I mean, it, hopefully it's still all going to happen next year. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's tough. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. And then um, sorry, I just lost my spot. Um, so. You said you were in Arizona for quarantine, and what have you been doing to stay in shape as well as baseball shape uh, just every day? 
Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm actually, I was in Arizona for spring training. Um, my yeah. brother, because he's with the big league side of things with the Angels, so he was there for oh, spring shoot. training. So I Got live it. with him, but he lives full time here in Newport Beach, California. So we came back Got here okay. to quarantine. So I've been in Newport Beach since uh, mid March, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, I've, I I came here because I knew the weather was nice, and I knew no matter what's closed, I can still most likely do stuff outside. There's a guy from Team Israel that's with the Indians and lives ten minutes down the road, so I knew I could do all my throwing with him. Uh, although my brother still is working from home every day, he was a catcher in college and he's caught me over the years plenty. So he catches my bullpens and there's some other spots to go. Um, the place that Zach trains out here, um, is allowing some pro guys and college guys to come in and train. So that's something that I'm, I'm also here because I knew I was going to have that. I knew I would have a place to lift three or four days a week. And for me right now, it's, really important that I stay ready because if we are sent back to play or to spring training, like I'm, I'm, this is my first audition. So I need to be as ready as possible. So that's why I came, chose to come here. So I'm pretty much in a normal routine every day. I mean, like wake up, do whatever reading, drink your coffee, eat every eat, and then go and spend a few hours at the field, a few hours in the gym. And by the time I come back here, it's like, honestly, catching up with, friends, family. I've had plenty of Zoom calls like this. So honestly, that takes up a majority of my day. We try to hike every Sunday and that's that's pretty much everything. Awesome. Yeah, especially for a lot of a lot of people now aren't even athletes aren't even able to get that even just everyone. So it's really lucky yeah. that you have that at hey, your you, disposal. Hey guys, one second. They're hanging, they're hanging up. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. No How's problem. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you had a lot of injuries in college, uh, some pretty major ones, and I even uh, saw you uh, while you had these injuries when you were coaching me uh, yep. when I was in like middle school. Uh, I remember sometimes it was even hard for you just to sit in your car. It looked really painful. So. Oh my God! You saw me after. Uh... <laughs> wasn't it like your disc? No. Oh my God. You saw me after I had a double hernia surgery. So oh. not, a, not a herniated disc. Hernia is like in like, like your lower abdomen. Right. So yeah. you, saw me, you saw me after that. So like yeah. getting in and out of the car was not fun. Yeah, I forgot. And I had, so I had shoulder surgery that May and then hernia surgery that June. And then I came home after that. Right. So, yeah. 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 So how did you like, that must be like really hard to deal with all that, especially during college. So like, how did you find the motivation to like not let your injuries set you back, especially emotionally. And like, how did you find the motivation to keep playing baseball? And like, especially like considering how much success you've been having these last few yeah. years. Um, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. I'd say uh, that answer for me um, at the end of the day, the base of it is like, I just had to answer the question like aspirations versus expectations. Like aspirations are what you dream of and expectations are like what you, what you realistically think are going to happen. And my whole life, I think, or I guess more so when I think professional baseball became a possibility, probably like later on in high school, like I thought my aspirations, my, my expectations lined up pretty well. And then as you get injured in college, like your expectations go down significantly. Like I went in a, a pretty high recruit to my school and for my class and then I was injured right away a few weeks into my freshman fall and redshirted my freshman year due to surgery pitched my sophomore year junior year I received a medical hardship because I got hurt like right before that deadline and that's the summer I came home to be with you guys and even that next year my senior year rehabbing from the shoulder and the hernias like I missed that whole year because the shoulder took so long and I actually injured myself again rehabbing so that was the timeline and stringing string along of events of all those. But like, I think for me, because like I always saw professional baseball, something that, that was like, I was meant to do it was meant for me. And like, I was good enough to do it. Like that was always there. And then after shoulder surgery, that was completely shot to shit. Like, there's no way I can play pro ball. Like, I just want to have a college experience. I haven't played college baseball. I just want to be able to throw a ball again. But for me, like, it really, like, it doesn't come down to, like, the aspirations and, like, the dreams of, like, playing Major League Baseball. It's like, I want to make a career of this because I truly enjoy doing it. I enjoy going to the field every day. I enjoy going to the weight room every day. I enjoy learning more every single day. So, like, I truly want to do this for as long as I possibly can. 
that with like I think there's no better feeling in the world than like punching out the last hitter of the inning and walking off the mound after throwing up a zero. Like there's nothing better than that. And like I want to be able to experience that and provide entertainment for fans for the rest of my life or not the rest of my life, but as long as I possibly can. Um, so I think that's something I always wanted to do. And like you deal with all these down moments. It's like I was always the type of person that like I always needed to be doing something to improve or get to where I want to go. So it took a few surgeries for me to, I guess, a few injuries for me to really, really unlock like the new level of player development and getting better. But like over time for me, it was like there's always ways that there was always like nuances and new things coming up in baseball training where you could get better in different ways. And like the science behind it was always changing. So like I really stayed up to date on that. And once I made the transition actually in college from pitcher to hitter, because I was a hitter in grad school, like I played the infield and hit and then made the return to pitching my sixth year where I hit and pitched. So like for me, it was like when that happened, when you're injured, like this always sticks with me. And I always say to people when they get hurt, like it's only going to get uphill from here. Like you hurt yourself. Okay. Once you have the game is constantly changing and ways to get better are always enhancing. So like fine. Like I was always the type that boom, you're hurt. Like it can't get much worse than this. It's all going to go uphill from here. You get surgery and you can start rehabbing, but like, how can I set myself apart? And I think from like the training and player development side of it, like there were things that I discovered and started to learn around my fifth year, um, first and first and then into second year of grad school that really like completely transformed my formed my game and made me back into like a professional finding these new developments and implementing them to my practice and re- and then becoming like a potential professional again, like basically brought me back to that point where like I knew it was something that was there for me and I mean there's really been no looking back since it's been hard at times where I've had success like you're throwing hard enough and you're throwing your stuff is good enough where you think you can play with an organization and should get signed and it it took a long time Um, but I mean yeah I mean always finding ways to set myself apart and get better throughout all the injuries whether it was just to get myself on the field again or to become a professional prospect like that's kind of what kept me going. And I mean, I was always very, very resilient and I never wanted my career to end in a way where I had no control over how it was ending. Like I wanted to, like, I want to, I want to be on the field, not be forced off from injury. Yeah. You must've felt like lucky to get six years. Cause like, that's like the last like chance you have to like complete college athletes. Yeah. I mean, it was, my case was really straightforward because I missed my entire freshman year due to surgery. And then my right. junior year, I, had served or was injured before the period. So like my red shirt process was really, really straightforward. Um, and fortunately I, I graduated in four years and it gave me the opportunity to get a master's degree while I was still playing baseball. Yeah. Um, so where do you see yourself, uh, like, uh, a year from now or even like more than that like five years from now in terms of like your baseball life i mean i hope to still be playing then i mean i'm someone who wants to whenever ball in america slows down for me i want to stay involved in the international circuit so i could definitely see myself playing for at least that much longer if not more i know that the window here has been closing and is closing but luckily i'm in a good spot now where i can hopefully infiltrate affiliate ball with an impact Um, but I mean, one year from now, I hope that at this time, one year from now, I'm in double A, triple A, the big league somewhere, something with the Cubs. Well, I want to play in the Olympics. And if I'm in the big leagues this time next year, that's going to be hard. Um, so, I mean, I just want, I want to be playing in a good situation with the Cubs, healthy and successful and, um, preparing for the Olympic, I guess a year from now, we'd be pretty, we'd be a month and a half, two months away from our Olympic training camp. Um, and five years from now, whatever that is, like, I hope I'm still with an organization and I hope I'm still playing. And if that's not the case, like I will exhaust the international options, whether that's Latin America continuing to play winners in Australia or maybe something in Asia where a little bit more money can be made. So I still must still see myself involved, especially as a player. All right. Um, Jonathan, that's all we got for you today. Thanks so much for coming on the show. It means a lot. Um, we wish you luck. It's pretty awesome yeah, that you're luck. with the Cubs. It's pretty freaking awesome that you're with Israel. Um, 
that's like a lot to accomplish. That's a lot to be proud of. So good luck. Um, and we'll see you later, man. And right. stay safe with everything. You guys too. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. No problem. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. See ya. All right. All right. All right. So that was probably the best interview we've had yet. Uh, moving forward into our next segment, um, we're going to be talking about Major League Baseball, sticking with the baseball topic. And it's going to be about the draft. So this year, the draft will be five rounds, and anyone undrafted will have a max salary of $20,000 to sign. Um, then those free, those guys will be free agents, and they're their maximum is going to be $20,000. So um, how do we feel about this, Bryce? Um, you know, I kind of understand because, I mean, everything in sports is going to be shortened due to quarantine and the virus. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the maximum of $20,000. Of 20, I understand that the MLB is not going to make as much money this year as they usually do. Um, you know, $20,000 is hard. Um, I know people who play in the minor leagues, like single A, went before, before this, when, you know, the maximum, where the minimum, or, or when the maximum was way higher than that. Uh, and then, and even before this, they only got $10,000. So I can't even imagine what the minimum is now. Uh, you know, I understand it, it might have to be done. Uh, but at the same time, it kind of sucks. And, uh. You know, this is going to leave uh, a lot less chances for guys to make it to the majors because there's going to be so many free agents. But, uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, my opinion, obviously, five to f- from four, from the usual 40 rounds to five, you don't know when you're ever going to see that, that next seventh round gem, 10th round gem. Even, yeah. You know what? Let's say it, 40th round gem. my answers i i don't think anyone's gonna like the <laughs> answers but let's just get right into it um i'm gonna give my order first next year i got um i got bills jets dolphins and then patriots you're now, capping no let me let me <laughs> come on I, you give your order and then i'll explain all right go ahead. no no go no explain that now Okay, I I honestly think, I, okay, the Bills absolutely we know they're going to win the division unless something awful happens. I mean, I, I wouldn't want it, but let's say Josh Allen gets hurt, someone like their big player they sign gets hurt, Stephon Diggs. Uh, so, Bills are going to be number one. Jets. Uh, the only reason I'm saying the Jets over the Dolphins is because the. Uh, the only reason I'm thinking is because I don't know how the Jets could screw this up anymore. Like, this team is decent. This team is good. Uh, they they got a lot of key pieces. They got the wide receiver, uh, what's his name, in the second round. Um, I don't even know his name. They got – um. I'm a Jets fan. I don't even know. It's just how much I pay attention to the Jets, my own team. Pay attention to more than other teams. But, but Kai Beckton, I really like that guy they got for running back. It's just – I didn't. I wasn't upset with the offensive line as much as I would have liked a wide receiver and a guy like maybe uh, what's it, uh, CD Lamb go go first round to them. But I'm okay with it. They needed offensive line, so there. I, the Dolphins. I, I just don't see them. I, I see them winning with Fitzpatrick. I see Tua taking a lot of time, and I think he's going to struggle. And if they end up wanting him, they're going to put him in by week 13. So they're playing the, the Joe Burrow. Uh, the, the Joe Burrows, actually. We're not even going to call them the Bengals. So, honestly, it's it, I don't see them doing anything great. And then the Patriots, I mean, uh, as much as I want I, – I, I know they're going to be second. I just don't want to say it. I just don't want to admit it, you know? I just want to say they're last because as a Jets fan, I have one year to say they're going to freaking be last. But then it's going to cause everyone to get him, the Trevor Lawrence, to go there. But anyway, okay, I'm I sorry. Know, I, I, 
I thought you were an honest Jets fan. I thought you knew that you were going to have a losing record every year until the day you die, but I guess not. Let me put you on blast real quick. The New York football effing Jets are the New York Knicks of football, period. All right? I got... The Browns. (laughs) Maybe. Uh, I got either the Patriots or the Bills for first place. It's going to be close. It's going to be close. Both of those teams are going to have around 10 wins, if especially if Bill Belichick uh, doesn't do anything to make this team better before the season starts. It's going to be close. And then whoever isn't first will be second. After that, third place will be the Dolphins. Are they going to be good? Probably not, although I do love to. I, I do love to. I'm going to up and leave now. I'm going to get up and leave. <laughs> um but yeah, no, I like Tua, but the Dolphins aren't going to be great. I don't know if they'll be horrible, but they're not going to be great. And then, I mean, the Jets. I mean, that's self-explanatory. They're they're you know they're gonna they're gonna win four to five games, and you know they're gonna be last it's place. Bryce, you're not remembering. They won eight games last year and went six and two at the end of the season or something like that. They went two and six about. and then six and two. Don't know what, what are you? Talking I, I don't, about. No, it's true. Like, I, I'm not saying this team's going to be great. I'm not saying this team's going to make the playoffs. I just don't see the Dolphins doing exactly everything they need next year, especially with the, probably a mid-quarterback change, considering Fitzmagic's going to start the season. Uh, or maybe they'll be dumb, and Fitzmagic proves that he's the next MVP, and then they trade to him. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but for real, like, because you know that's how he lives under pressure. But I'm saying – I just see the Patriots wanting to tank for Trevor Lawrence. I just don't, unless Stidham is a god, unless we're not seeing something that Bill Belichick is seeing with his quarterback football eyes, just his night vision goggles he has for football. So hot I don't take, know. hot take, the Giants, or no, I'm in, no, Daniel Jones, he's going to suck big, you know what, and then the Giants are going to tank this year and get Trevor Lawrence. F the Patriots. Okay, no, anyway. no, no, no. Trevor Lawrence is not going to do Patriots. Right, it's not going to be right. another Tom Brady six-wing era. I'm not watching that. Okay, it's I Giants, look, Giants I, Trevor Lawrence, I, F okay, Daniel as, Jones. He's going to F it all Jets up. <laughs> as a Jets fan, I would honestly not – as much as I would hate to, like, hate to see it as a Jets fan – I really want to see Trevor Lawrence go to the Patriots. I just really want to see that. Like, I think as a football That's like fan, James Wiseman going to the Warriors. Okay. As, okay, or as a Jet, as, I think as any – as a Jets fan or, like, a Giants fan or any team like that, you're going to hate it. You're going to freaking hate it. But as a football fan, I think that would be great to see Tom Brady – do whatever he can in, in the on the Bucks, and then see what Trevor Lawrence can do with Bill Belichick and the Patriots. I think that would – you're getting one of the greatest football prospects in probably history combining with one of the greatest coaches in NFL history, if not the greatest. I think that would be the greatest system. That, in, or, I that already that, happened, and it I was think better than Tom Brady. I think that'd be better than Tom Brady. I'm not even gonna lie, but th- I think this is a to- this is something for another time. We can talk about the Patriots future another time. <laughs> anyway, right. what's your most, all right. What's your most improved? My most improved is going to be the Bills. The Jets. Um, oh, okay. No, the Bills. The Jets. I do see them improving. I see them doing well. I don't see them making the playoffs, even if they are a second seed, uh, the second seed in the uh, AFC East, as I say. But I, I think the. I think they're the next the next team. I think any team to win the division is the next team, but the most the, is the most improved team. I think that's my opinion. Um, so I, I would just go with the Bills. What about you? Yeah, no, I'm actually gonna go Bills. Also, um, they did. You know, I was hoping they would get past the first round last year, but they did uh, pretty well last year, better than usual. Um, yeah. I think they can produce the same thing that they did last year except uh possibly a little better um it would be kind of nice to see them in the second round uh so yeah i mean i yeah. think it'll be the bills probably about 10 wins and uh hopefully a solid playoff performance well they they went 10 and 6 last year yeah. uh, if i'm correct yeah they did. Uh, if anything they may get a win or two more but i, I think I think we're looking at most improved as far as again who's winning the division in in this in this division because I think that's that's proves you're the most improved. Yeah, um, yeah I mean I don't and yeah I don't really think anyone in that division uh, has the potential to improve more than them this year, uh, especially the Patriots. If if anything, the yeah, Patriots are going I, I downwards. 
I don't think we're talking wins either because obviously I think the Dolphins. Yeah, and the no, Jets are going for me. Like yeah, that. the Dolphins are definitely going to have more wins than last year. But I think as far as just outright, I think just talent and everything in general, they just yeah. got Stephon Diggs and a lot of other pieces. So yeah. yeah. All right. So brightest future. I got the. Okay. As far as don't players. <laughs> I I see. I would say the only reason I'd say the Dolphins is because Woody Johnson is not their owner. I think I think the Jets have a better team. I think the Jets have better pieces as far as now the upgraded offensive line, um, the, the the running back with bringing in Frank Gore definitely helped, and I think it'll even help Le'Veon Bell in a way that we're not thinking. We're just thinking of Beckton. Um, as far as wide receivers, we have to work on that. I would say the Jets if it wasn't Woody Johnson. If the Dolphins were the Jets, I would say the Jets. And Sam Darnold, I think, is going to be better than Tua. But Tua and the Dolphins, I'm going to go with them only because their name isn't the New York Jets. And it looks like Tua, if he stays healthy, can really work this thing out. Uh, what about you? I think it's close between the Dolphins and Bills, but I got the Bills. Uh, no. The Bills are going to be better this year than they were last year. And I think, uh, you know, hopefully they can sustain that. And uh, I think they'll be not only better this year than last year, but the year after that and maybe even the year after that. Uh, You know, I think the Dolphins will um, have a bright future, but it's going to be further down the line than just like three years from now. Whereas the Bills, their brightest future is going to be more immediate. So... Yeah, um, Yeah. I, you know. I was looking more in the long run. I mean, the Bills, you could say, have the brightest in the moment. But I I just don't know if – I think I need one more year to see. If, talk to me in a year because I don't know. I, I need to see one more year of what Josh Allen can do, and especially now with Diggs. And I think we need – and, again, I talk to me in a year. The brightest future is going to be the Patriots if they end up drafting Trevor Lawrence. Or we, we see that Stidham ends up being the guy. So – Again, and it, I think brightest future, I need to evaluate one more season, especially being an AFC East fan. But again, I live in a fantasy, so I don't think you can take anything I say for uh, with, with take everything I say with a grain of salt. Yeah, um, yeah, I think the Bills got the best future for the next two or three years, but then after that, four or five years from now, it'll be the Dolphins. Jets, <clears throat> what? Okay, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I think I think there's gonna there's a lot up in the air about this division. I think. There always is as far as the two, three, four seed, except for the one. It's always kind of up in the air from from there. So it, this is the first year it's, everything's going to be up in the air, I think, unless the Patriots just end up figuring out a way to go 16 and out like they always freaking do. It's okay, though. Yeah. It's going gonna, it's gonna, to – I'm sorry. Yeah. I, have, <laughs> I, I have PTSD every year. Just don't. Yeah. Uh, All right, guys. Anytime That's I think show... that, like, Sorry. I was gonna say, anytime I think Jets, I think Buff Fumble. So like, you can't really, yeah, you can go up, honestly. Yeah. So, but, uh, um, all right, guys, that's our show for you guys today. We know this was probably way longer than usual. Um, I think it was worth it though. That that was probably our best interview yet with Jonathan. Oh, um, for sure. We're gonna shout out his social media. Uh, make sure to follow him. We'll have his in the description. We'll have his social media on our Instagram. Uh. And also, guys, give us some feedback, whether it's in the comments or on our Instagram. You know, tell us, you know, tell us your opinions on what we said. Uh, you know, give requests for videos on, you know, maybe you want to hear us talk about something in particular. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. I'm Bryce. I'm Ross. And that was a great show for you. See you next time. Peace.